Okay. All right. So it's recording. So let's go back to our thing. Okay. So uh, let's. let's all right. So uh, we we stopped yesterday. I think we we stopped at the scientific statement. I think that's what we were discussing last. All right. So uh, I've just made uh, I might have made a small uh, uh, misstatement in the previous class. I'm not sure, but I might have said that uh, if I make a statement which is let's say this room is very warm. Okay. I would have said this is. I might have probably said that this is not a this is a subjective statement. I was talking about the subjective assessment of the word warm. Okay. So. But one thing you have to understand is that because these distinctions that we are discussing, we are talking about scientific statements because you can connect it in some way to positive statements. But the point we are trying to emphasize, we'll explain this uh, in greater detail also later, but that uh, all scientific statements will necessarily be positive statements. So make sure you understand this, uh, the, uh, the scientific statement as defined by Karl Popper, that it must be falsifiable and as uh, for, for something to be falsifiable, it has to be very specific okay so uh, so that's why that's another property of a scientific statement so generally all scientific statements will be positive statements because they will describe some state of affairs right so a scientific statement will say that Mars is uh, you know 20 light years away from uh, Venus or something like that okay it's a statement about what is the fact but that may or may not be true but you can it's because it's so uh, specific that you can uh, identify you can prove this statement to be false it is capable of being for proved false that does not mean it has to be false you understand this point okay very important because it, it, it's a general point uh, of importance because many times you come across people who are talking about making statements pretending to be scientists but you will find if you really analyze their statements using the Karl Popper standard you'll find that the statement is not stand uh, and many experts will make statements which are very vague and general statements so these statements are not capable of being proved false they're not sufficiently specific and therefore they are not scientific statements and that's an important uh, assessment regarding those types of statements so you should have this idea in your head okay but all positive statements need not be scientific statements so if I say that this room is very warm okay you realize this is a pos this is actually a positive statement because I'm describing a state of affairs I'm describing what is I'm giving you my impression of the room which is that this room is very warm I'm not saying it should be colder or it should be bigger or anything like that there's no should be in it but it's a it's it's not a scientific statement because what is the meaning of how can you prove that my statement is false because warm is not uh, specific right so I can say that even five degrees Celsius is warm for me maybe I'm an Eskimo or something like that so uh, so even five so so therefore you can't prove it to be false because it's not specific enough so that the statement can be proved to be false this is point clear we will come across these kinds of statements very soon uh, in contract law as well so you should be aware of this kind of uh, distinction that all scientific statements are positive statements using positive with a Okay, so um, all scientific statements are positive, but all pos all positive statements need not be scientific. I just give you an example of a positive statement, which is that I said that this room is very warm. Okay, but that's not a scientific statement because very warm is a subjective. It's not specific enough. You can't prove this to be false. Yes. Yeah. What is the problem, Saloni? Any problem? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so is this point? So we will make many such uh, uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, statements in the future as we go along. Like we will say that all contracts are agreements, but all agreements are not contracts. Okay. So we will be so get get comfortable with this idea. All right. Okay. Now briefly, I just point this. I'm not going to open this. There's this uh, very nice uh, economics uh, website, both micro and macro points are handled in a non-mathematical way by this professor in New York so uh, you I think one of the things that you need to have as an MBA student is uh, even if you're not going in for finance you should have a good understanding of economics which people expect because policy questions are uh, involved these kinds of concepts 
so both micro and macro what i would recommend is that uh, if you have any problems with uh, you can obviously turn this or has taught you economics you can go and check with him but this is a useful site because it's a non-mathematical treatment but conceptually it handles all the concepts that are involved in micro and macro so uh, you can if you feel more comfortable with a non-mathematical treatment which i think actually is uh, it's always better to treat it uh, teach the subject non-mathematically because you focus on the concepts you still have to be logical it doesn't mean that it's easy right you still have to understand logically the concepts but this is a non-mathematical treatment of economics so you can use this resource remember this is again one of those things where i'm like your coach i'm telling you that in your spare time you need to work on your backhand so this is stuff that you have to do on your time on your own time okay it's your responsibility i'm telling you this is something people expect so you take care of it how how, how you do it is your problem but you find time to make sure that you are very well versed in all the concept and this is also a way of checking if you can figure out all the concepts in this resource okay it's a way of being sure that okay i have some basic knowledge of economics micro and macro okay you understand what i'm saying it's your responsibility to tell and if you have questions you get stuck you can ask your in the sir you can ask me all right so we'll move on with our uh, discussions now we are what we are discussing is similar topics okay similar distinctions we started with normative versus positive and now the second one in that description in that set is uh, descriptive versus pres uh, versus prescriptive okay so these are not exactly similar but they are quite similar so that's why we are discussing them together okay so in descriptive versus prescriptive does anybody want to hazard a guess which of these is more like normative and which of these is more like positive yes monira one 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 at a time one at a time yeah don't have to get up just sit that sit and answer yeah no normative you're saying is prescriptive okay and and descriptive is positive okay anybody else with a different view so monira is saying that normative is more like prescriptive and descriptive is more like positive anybody else with a different view yeah pretty much everybody agrees okay so that's what it is because when your doc when your doctor prescriptive you remember you have a prescription from a doctor so the doctor says you should take this you don't have to take it you can many times we ignore the prescription okay so therefore the doctor says it you should take it so prescriptive is remember normative is something about some statement about how it should be okay how it ought to be or how it should be so prescriptive is therefore more like normative okay we will see these words being used later on very soon uh, uh, but the point to remember is another distinction that people make descriptive versus prescriptive is very similar to normative versus positive because i just gave you an example the statement i am uh, this room is very warm that's a descriptive statement because i'm describing the state of affairs in the room and that's a positive statement because it describes the state of affairs it does not uh, talk about what ought to be or all that okay so this is clear the first set of distinction distinctions we'll move fairly quickly with this if you have doubts you can ask questions and then you can revise of course and ask questions again later on subjective versus objective which do you think is uh, there again as i said they're not exactly the same but they're similar if you had to match subjective against uh, subjective versus objective against normative versus positive <laughs> yeah okay subjective is normative and objective is more like positive clear everybody is agreeing you don't have to note this down as such because it's in your notes anyway but you should be able to see the connection roughly okay let me just reduce the spaces so we can see everything in one um, this is one of the problems of putting spaces that uh, you, when you want to see everything in one uh, view okay subjective so what we are saying is see again we are saying that these are not exactly the same but the reason I'm discussing these points is what happened here uh, one minute, no, no, I just uh, show them and uh, what is your name? I've oh, okay, okay, that is Barun. Okay, 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 so don't talk, okay, because I get distracted when I see people talking or doing any, anything else. Okay, so uh, I'm just coming to uh, Mehul's question. Okay, so what we are trying to say is that these are not similar, they, I mean, these are not exactly the same, but they are similar. 
so that's why we are discussing them together because you should be aware of the, the at the same time you can't say that they are not similar there there is some similarity okay so that's why we want to discuss so what we are discussing is uh, when you are looking at subjective versus objective and comparing it to normative versus positive which of these is um, better matched with normative and which is better matched with positive that's all we are saying so what Monira is saying is objective is better matched with positive because remember what is subjective versus objective objective so if i say that uh, if i i give you an example of instructions i said if i give you an instruction saying that switch on the ac whenever it gets very warm that's a subjective instruction or objective subjective, subjective because what is very warm it may differ for different people right the very warm is different for different people but if i tell you that the switch on the ac whenever it goes above 16 celsius now that is objective because 16 celsius is the same for everybody is this point clear yeah everyone is convinced yes, yes? so that's what we are saying so what we are saying is therefore uh, subjective uh, matters are if between uh, if you have to match subjective with normative and or positive it's better matched with normative because remember normative statements are about what should be so those are they can differ for different people right like i could say that uh, people should not drink alcohol some people might say that why should why should they not drink alcohol so that view may not be shared with everybody so it is subjective now people should not drink alcohol that's a normative statement or people should not smoke that's a normative statement right are you following what i'm saying yes okay so that's what we mean so subjective here is better matched with normative and objective is better matched with positive is this clear to everyone that's all we are saying we're not saying that they are exactly the same but if you had to match them there is some similarity is everyone following chinmay you're following okay yeah nobody has any uh, issues if you have any doubts no don't get scared like i'm saying nobody i hope nobody has any issues don't care so just uh, if you have any doubts at any point of time some point you feel is not flowing logically from one point to the other uh, please ask a question okay because the, as i said your objective here is not to memorize stuff but to conceptually understand everything that is being taught all right so that's very important therefore to ask questions and clarify your doubts yes ma'am mayul doubt is clarified okay good. okay so we have one more set of distinction distinctions gone now we are coming to one more set of distinctions uh, morality and ethics on the one side so i'm just not going to say ethics anymore i'll just say morality but i mean when people say okay your behavior is immoral or your behavior is unethical okay okay so these are normative considerations you can already see this these are what is uh, what is moral what is immoral like i can again i can say, say smoking cigarettes is immoral okay or you know so now some people may not agree so this is a normative it is matched better with normative than with positive right okay and legality is legality is matched better with positive because legality talks about what the law is right what is there in the law and then if you go out of that uh, boundary then you're uh, doing things which are illegal right so we'll just explain it briefly i'll just explain briefly first morality versus legality then we can go back and see this distinction but what we are trying to discuss is morality versus legality okay so what we are saying here in a way it's good that we study everything with a multidisciplinary approach i will make take you back to your mathematics set theory you guys all remember your set theory in set theory you have elements you have elements in a set remember every set has elements like here if i say section b is a set of students now section b has 60 students so there are 60 elements in the in the set right okay so what am i saying here that in the discussion with morality and legality i'm saying that the set of all immoral acts so on one side if i have the set of all immoral acts and on the other side i have the set of all illegal acts what we are saying is that the set of all immoral acts will have more elements here on this side we'll have more elements than on this side which are illegal acts because many immoral acts may not be illegal okay but most illegal acts are also immoral you agree with the statement generally murder is illegal most people will agree that murdering people is immoral right 
so theft is immoral theft is illegal most people will agree so if you look at most of the things which are illegal most of them are considered that's why i said it may not always be true but generally it is true okay that's why i said is likely to have right so if you like if you line up all the immoral acts on one side okay you will see that they have more elements the set of all immoral acts will have more elements in it than the set of all illegal acts are you following what i'm saying okay we are doing a refresher of set theory but so what we say is that another way of saying this i'm not going to explain it uh, i did explain it briefly in the other class so this actually what this is is uh, the illegal acts is actually a strict subset of all the immoral acts you remember this term strict subset from uh, set theory yes. okay so strict subset means it, the immoral acts contain all the illegal acts plus some other acts plus some other elements that's the meaning of subset uh, a strict subset right okay just to refresh your maths also a little bit um, okay is this clear now that's all we are saying that morality is a broader concept than legality okay so now what we are uh, now i'll just give you the so i'll just give you the example of one example briefly okay which we had this we still have this on the books in the indian penal code there's a section 497 which deals with adultery but about a year ago what happened was the supreme court in a case has ruled that this uh, section should no longer be con considered constitutionally valid so it is not going to be enforced anymore remember that the under separation of powers the role of the judiciary is to interpret the law and one of the types of interpretation that they do is on the constitutional interpretation like what is happening now also under CAA there's a challenge to the constitution constitutionality of the act and then the Supreme Court will decide whether it's constitutional or not uh, but the one of the things they did here was that this they said this act is this provision is discriminatory uh, against the woman so now this is no longer enforced okay this will no longer be enforced people cannot be punished for adultery anymore now uh, so it is adultery therefore in india is no longer illegal okay and this is a british these are all british era laws actually and britain has also abolished uh, adultery is no longer a criminal offense it hasn't been in the uk for a long time but we still had it on the books and recently about a year ago so now this adultery is no longer illegal in india but would you agree that most people would still consider it to be immoral <laughs> you agree so most people will say this is an unethical or immoral act but it is no longer an illegal act and india is also an example now okay is this clear so you see an example of what is something what is immoral what might be considered immoral but is not unethical yeah uh, to diminish which act no this is actually not an act here we say this is the act is the indian penal code which we call ipc okay this is the this is the act okay or uh, the statute okay and this is only a section within the act they have the power to do that that's part of the interpretative role uh, the role of the judges in interpreting the law that's part of their role one is to interpret normal controversies in the law in the interpretation of the law to decide controversies. and the other is as you can see what is happening with many acts what happens is the challenge the constitutionality of the act is challenged like earlier when we had uh, certain uh, like there's an act in bankruptcy law called surface act you might have heard of this securitization it's a big name but it's about uh, recovery of debts okay even the debt recovery act direct recovery tribunal act drt act all of those acts when they were passed they were challenged by say, uh, people said that these acts were not constitutional so the constitutional validity of an act is also one of the deciding the constitutional validity of an act is also one of the roles of the judges in interpreting the law this is clear that interpreting a law means when you take a new law like say for instance CAA has been challenged now recently so the judges will look at that law and they will interpret this law and see whether it is consistent with the Constitution if it is not consistent consistent with the Constitution obviously any law will be struck down so here also what they have done in this case they have not struck down a law as such but they have struck down a section of the penal code they have said a section of the penal code is violative of article 14 which is uh, equal uh, right uh, equal treatment 
and they've said this discriminates against women so this can no longer be enforced so now you have a situation which is illegal this situation is no longer illegal adultery but is most likely to be considered immoral by most people this is clear so all we are showing you here is that you don't have to go into the details of this uh, I'm going to just make everything here whatever is optional in this in these notes is uh, put into italics I didn't want to put it into italics initially because if you wanted to get into the details of how to read a section there are certain italics which I have applied here so that's why I did not uh, put into italics but so I leave that here like this but you can know that this this is just for the sake of giving you the example you don't have to understand this section and remember this section or anything like that all we are showing you here is certain things are considered immoral but they may not be illegal that's all is this clear okay so we are moving on and now once again matching uh, morality versus legality morality is more like normative or positive normative, normative right because no morality is going to be different for different people right different people would consider different things to be immoral okay so therefore and then the um, legality is more like positive because you know what is legal or illegal like if you want to see the companies act uh, like here's a section from the companies act uh, in chapter 3 section 23 here what you want to know what to do with respect to prospectus uh, when you're making a public issue etc uh, public offer this is what it is and what you feel about all this is not really so relevant this is the law so it is kind of a objective it's like me saying that switch on the AC whenever it gets to 16 Celsius so that's very clear instructions for everybody right so there's no question of uh, personal viewpoints all right okay so this is so that's another distinction so these are all distinctions that we are discussed yeah here we come to the last set of distinction distinctions that are going to be discussed as part of your syllabus which is uh, which is very important from a judicial interpretation understanding judicial interpretations okay which is on the one hand we have these two okay and on the other hand we have these two so I will only talk about formalism versus realism but when I do that you have to understand that I'm talking about positivism formalism on one side versus this and this okay on the other side okay so we'll talk about formalism and realism but let's just briefly understand what legal positivism is so if you see legal positivism started as a reaction to natural law legal theory now this thing you'll understand you can relate to it very easily from what is going on in the country today uh, natural law legal theory was just a view that uh, the authority of a legal standard derives necessarily derives from the moral merit of these standards I put the key words in bold okay what does this mean you can see it firsthand and what's going on in the country today like many people are saying that uh, like say Mamta Banerjee has said that we will not enforce this uh, will not allow the CA to be enforced because essentially what she's saying is that according to me it's an immoral law right immoral or unethical or unfair or whatever right so she's saying that so many other people are also saying that so we will not allow some of the states are saying we will not allow it to be enforced so what they are essentially saying is that this this is the law obviously which has been passed by Parliament and signed by the president so officially it is a law and under in under our Indian constitutional framework but what they are saying is now we don't recognize the authority of this law so the authority of the legal standard we don't recognize the authority of the legal standard okay because according to us this law has no moral merit is this this is what they're saying you understand what they're saying so what uh, yes uh, Rishabh you agree what no you understand you know what these people are saying like those who are taking this position that we will not allow it to be enforced so what we are saying is that means they are not acknowledging the authority of the legal standard the law can be seen as the legal standard so we are not acknowledging the authority we don't accept the authority of the legal standard because why because not because we are saying that the president has not signed this law or it was not passed by two houses of parliament no we are not saying that we are saying we don't accept the authority of the law because according to us this law has no moral merit moral merit you understand moral it has no moral merit means according to me it's immoral or unethical or unfair or whatever these are all related to moral merit you agree yes Sahil you're following the logic what we are describing the position taken by these people is that when they say that we will not allow this to be enforced because what they are criticizing basically saying it's unfair or discriminatory or whatever so in a way they are saying that this is not more this is more uh, immoral is that a fair description yes 
you don't agree with my description is is it fair to say that we can say that it's like they're criticizing the the law as being immoral or unfair unethical yes, yes or no yes sir. many people are not convinced i think jitma is also not convinced but my description you agree with what i'm saying that in a way what they're saying is that this law is not moral Yes, that's what they're saying. Similar to that. Yes. Yes. Reji, uh, RJ. <laughs> Don't talk to him. Talk to me. Okay, guys. Now I need my gavel. Okay. All right. So you get the point I'm trying to make. So what I'm trying to show you a situation from a real life situation in our own country today where people are applying this kind of thinking where they're saying that we don't recognize this law. That means for us, this law has no authority. We don't recognize the authority of this legal standard because we think it's an immoral law. You get the point? Okay, so this is a style of thinking which was prevalent even in, in the UK. You can see it in many countries. This is a natural human tendency. Many people can react like this. So it exists in many countries. So in, uh, let's say in England at the time of John Austin, which is the early 19th century, where you had this uh, same kind of problem. And this basically, this was the thesis of the natural law legal theory people. Those who believed in natural law legal theory, they used to say these kinds of things. They used to say that we will decide the authority of a legal standard based on what we think to what we think is the moral merit of the law. Whether the law is moral or immoral, that will determine whether the law has authority or not. Are you following the position? You don't have to agree with it, but we are trying to understand the position. Is this clear? So what John Austin, so how did positivism emerge? Okay, this is an important idea. How did positivism, so John Austin, so you understand the situation here? Okay, what we are talking about. Now John Austin, it's a reaction. So positivism was a reaction to natural law legal theory. Okay. Quiet, guys, don't talk between yourselves. Okay. So what he's saying is, what John Austin is saying, he came up, up uh, he came up with legal positivism and then what he said was that this is not acceptable, that the existence of uh, the validity of a law depends on socio-political facts and not on its moral merit. So he's opposing this view. Okay. Okay, guys, quiet. What happened? So what John Austin is saying is something like this. Let's relate it once again to our CAA controversy. What does he mean by? He says that the validity of a law depends on what happened here next to Mukul. Who is this? What is the problem? You have some question? Then don't talk between us. It's very distracting for me. When I hear, when I see people talking or I hear any noise. Okay, it's like a second soundtrack going on. Okay, guys, so what is John Austin saying? John Austin is saying that the you guys from natural law legal theory, you're saying that if you don't consider the law to be moral, you will not accept the validity of the law. This is not correct. The validity of the law, the validity of a law depends on the on socio-political facts. What are socio-political facts? What he means by that is how the law is made. So in India, this kind of socio-political fact is the fact that the law was so CA, he would say that CA is valid until the Supreme Court decide if the Supreme Court unless the Supreme Court decides that it's not constitutional otherwise it's valid because it has been passed by both houses of Parliament it has been signed by the president so it is a valid law are you saying are you following what he's saying by socio-political facts he's referring to the process of making the law so if he's saying that the process has been followed right like there were some acts in uh, i remember one act from bengal which was not uh, valid because the president had not signed it there was a requirement for the president to sign it but he had not signed it so unless you can point out that kind of procedural problem if the law has followed this system that is parliament both houses of parliament have passed the law the president has signed the law now it is a valid law whether you like the law whether you think the law is moral or immoral is of no consequence okay it does not affect the validity of the law because in, in england that time there was a debate about how should we decide the validity of the law and so john austin came into this debate and said that this is how you should decide the validity of the law okay that based on whether or not it has satisfied certain conditions like the way that the law should be made like in england the queen has to sign okay so parliament passes and the queen has to sign the law so therefore if that if that is done then it's a law and the moral merit of the law is of no relevance for determining its validity is this clear now 
okay you understand the positions okay you can agree with either position but uh, we are trying to understand the position so this is what positivism is okay so positivism says it tries to focus on this and uh, on the process by which the law is made and not on the moral merit of the law and so formalism is very closely related to positivism okay it tries to focus on the text of the on, on the actual law okay that is to express uh, if we go back briefly let's say at this point of time let's briefly go back to the are you guys getting bored yes, sir. yes. <laughs> so now section b is getting bored more easily but you have to understand these concepts yes muskan now again uh, we have <laughs> created another buddy group here okay so uh, now please try to understand these are just concepts which we are trying to cover which are important to understand how judicial decisions are made because we are coming now to the judicial philosophies okay formalism versus realism which is very important to understand so try to understand this even if you find it a little boring try to understand the concept yes mehul okay so positivism is first you have to understand that it it, it came as a as a reaction to um, let me just search for okay all right so first thing you have to understand is that legal positivism is a reaction to natural law legal theory that was the prevailing sentiment before john austin came onto the scene right so and what was natural law legal theory all about it was all about taking these kind of positions which you can see people are taking today some people are taking today in our country some of the state governments where they're saying that we don't accept the validity of this law because according to us this law is immoral so what they are saying is that actually the, that means the rule that they are using in their head is that the validity of the law depends upon the moral content of the law, the moral merit of the law, whether we think it is moral or not. Are you following the thinking? This is the thinking. Okay. So John Austin comes into this debate and says, no, I don't agree with this, that the validity of the law depends on certain process related social, socio-political facts. Okay. Such as, for instance, whether the house, whether both houses of parliament have passed the law and the queen has signed the law, which means queen is the head of state like our president. Okay. So if the queen has signed the law, then it's a valid law. Okay, and in the UK, you don't have this concept of uh, the judiciary deciding on the constitutionality of the law. The UK system is a parliamentary sovereignty system. So whatever parliament says in the UK, whatever parliament decides and the Queen signs, that's the law. The UK Supreme Court generally has no, recently they have started to create some problems, but in general, the UK follows a parliamentary sovereignty system. Okay, so the UK Supreme Court cannot comment on parliament's laws, parliament, whatever they say is supreme. So this is what it's, uh, what John Austin is saying, that the, the validity of the law is not a function of the moral merit of the law. It is a function of certain socio-political facts and conditions. Like if you follow the process of making the law, passage, passage through both houses of parliament, signed by the head of state now it's a valid law whether it's moral or immoral according to you is of no consequence to determining its validity is this clear yeah it's it's a, it's again this this position that he took himself this is also a normative position in some sense because he's saying that you should not follow at a high level this is a normative position in some sense okay but you are you maybe you're confused by the legal positivism term because positivism here tries to focus on what the law is but at a very high level if you see at a very high level as to what principle when you're discussing what principle should be adopted for determining the validity of the law at that high level these are in a sense these are this is a normative debate because there's no way to say that this is really wrong it's just that you have to convince people with your logic and john austin managed to bring uh, along a lot of people by convincing them that uh, the morality of the law should not be a factor in determining its validity it's a point of view okay but what he's saying is what is the point of view why is it called positivism because he is forcing you to look at the actual law making process the reality the exist the reality that is there got that has been uh, that we see with respect to the process of making the law 
that's why it's called legal positivism okay so i understand your why you have this question okay but is this clear now what it is okay so positivism essentially is saying that look at the real uh, look at some uh, look at the process of the making the law okay and that is what depends on that is what determines the validity of the law okay so formalism is related to this kind of thinking formalism is the most imp more important concept from a legal point of view for us okay but it's important to be aware of legal positivism what is formalism formalism essentially is i was taking you back to the um, the separation of powers okay uh, taking you back to the separation of powers if you remember so in legal formalism what we try to show is we try to show a high degree of respect for it's a way of approaching uh, judicial decision making okay remember the judge's job is to make the law uh, is to interpret the law remember that you can see that the judge's job is to interpret the law now while interpreting the law sometimes remember this concept uh, of uh, why I'm saying formalism is related to uh, to uh, positivism because very I'll give you some examples to show you that uh, there are many times when judges may uh, take uh, decide cases okay while deciding cases they uh, go outside this role this is a role for the judiciary the role of the judiciary under a separate separation of powers framework is the role of the judiciary is to interpret the law right not to make the law because who's going to make the law legislature is going to make the law but very often the judiciary actually ends up making the law i'll give you some examples like in if about seven or eight years ago we had a judge in the madras high court this is a real case where the judge in the madras high court actually said that if uh, a man and a woman have sexual relations then they are deemed to be married now the state of being married is actually something that is governed by certain laws in the country like we have the hindu marriage act we have the special marriage act all these kinds of acts which govern different types of marriages so the who has made these acts parliament right so these acts are made by so the question of whether two people are married is actually determined according to certain laws made by parliament okay so under the hindu marriage act you have to do the the seven rounds around the fire so actually if you do five rounds technically you're not married even under the hindu marriage act okay so now what is this judge saying so now you take an example what is that just uh, what is this judge saying in the madras high court is an actual case where he said that if a man and a woman have had sexual relations then they are deemed to be married so if a man and a woman have sexual relations and then they go through a half marriage where they go through only five rounds then what will happen in the eyes of the law made by parliament they are not married right because parliament requires seven rounds okay for the hindu marriage act now but in the eyes of this judge they are married are you following what i'm saying because the high court now the high court is actually the the rules of the country require that uh, the uh, district courts which are lying beneath that particular high court in under the madras high court they are all like required to follow the decisions of the madras high court okay so all these district court judges would all be bound by this now here's an example of where uh, a judge actually goes outside the role defined for him now you realize that in this particular case where the madras high court judge says this do you realize he's actually making the law yes, sir. can you see that he's making the law because the law is pronouncing on the question of who is married and who is not married that decision has been made by parliament by defining certain conditions under which you become married right but this judge is going beyond that and he's making the law he's remaking the law are you following okay so this is an example of uh, legal realism which i showed you as a contrast to legal formalism we are trying to understand formalism we can understand it better in, in relation to legal realism okay so here's an example of legal realism i'll just come to you so uh, here's an example of legal realism with this madras high court judge's decision to say that if man or, if a man and a woman have sexual relations they are deemed to be married deemed to be married means effectively they are married in the eyes of the law all right so this is an example of a violation of legal formalism and this is an example of legal realism which is obviously opposed right if i'm contrasting descriptive versus prescriptive that means prescriptive is not uh, the opposite of descriptive okay so formal realism is the op opposite of formalism okay so in formalism what we try to do is we try to be very careful a judiciary i mean uh, a judge who believes in legal formalism will be very careful to ensure that he is only interpreting the law and he's not doing what this madras high court judge did which is making the law or 
remaking the law so in formalism a judge tries to show great respect for this kind of constitutional structure as a separation of powers doctrine where they try to be very very careful about only interpreting the law and not remaking and making the law okay we'll give you another example later of making the law or remaking the law by the judiciary but are you getting some idea now yes Rishabh, what is your question no in this situation what would have happened is see the problem for the district court is they would have to send it up to the uh, high court madras high court okay for as uh, to the uh, chief justice because there's a conflict now because this judge is saying that if you have sex you're married and the hindu marriage act says that unless you go seven rounds and some other conditions are fulfilled you know there are some bars on marriage and all that so um, unless all those conditions are fulfilled you're not married so there's a conflict between the hindu marriage act and the judge's decision right so therefore uh, the the district court would have to send it up for the high court uh, full bench decision or division bench decision clarification eventually it would go up to the supreme court it might go up to the supreme court for clarification but actually eventually what this judge did was not correct so it would get shot down but the problem is it does create a problem for the district courts in the short term right because it slows down the decision making right yeah so one minute jakar uh, will go so first then, uh, okay the rest of you guys yes sonakshi no sorry i keep getting your name wrong i'm very sorry sonal sonal okay so i'm getting close okay so <laughs> okay no talking when when one person is asking a question that everybody else should not get into a uh, talking mode right so please concentrate on the question okay yes quiet quiet here quiet yeah no, no, I didn't understand your question. Unless we have, I understood the first part. Unless we have legal positivism, yes, we can't have legal formalism. Yes, you agree, I agree with that. That's a good assessment. Yes. Therefore, legal formalism is considered. Quiet, guys. Quiet. I need to hear his question because we don't even have mics in the class right now. I need to hear his question clearly. Be everybody else. Be quiet. Yes, Arushi. Don't encourage her. Just focus on the question. Okay. Sir, I wanted to establish the relation between persuasion and formalism. Okay. So, what I heard was that uh, when you have legal persuasion, then only you will uh, try to implement legal formalism. Yes, you're right. You're right. Therefore, legal formalism will be a subset of legal persuasion. So this is how I relate to Okay. Yeah, I suppose you could make that statement. It's a little bit of a strong statement. I'll have to evaluate properly and see whether because if you make a strong statement, they have to see that its statement is valid under all conditions. So but I get your idea that your idea is very much correct. So at this point I would recommend you just keep it at the level of that idea that without a belief in legal positivism, you can't have legal formalism. Because uh, that's the same kind of philosophy. That's why I've grouped them together, right? Okay, so you get an idea about formalism. We are trying to understand formalism in contrast to realism. Yeah, one minute. I'll just, Mehula has also had a question before that. I'll just come to you. So the idea here is the first idea that I'm trying to give you is that in formalism, remember formal, formal means quite strict that I want you to come to class wearing a suit and tie and everything. No informal casual at, at attire. So here formalism has this concept of strictness, okay, which means strictness in adhering to the separation of powers doctrine. What is the role of the judge? only to interpret not to make the law and also basically formally like what he pointed out that we follow the strict uh, we focus on the strict process the law was passed by parliament therefore it's a valid law it's passed by parliament signed by the president it's a valid law it went through the process okay so it's that's kind of you get the philosophy you get the picture right that it's a kind of a formal belief in the process okay uh, and that's what formalism really is about we'll give you some more examples and in contrast we showed you one example of realism where where a judge in the Madras High Court goes on to remake the law and then stray, strays outside these well-defined boundaries. Yes, Mehul, what was the question? So when he, uh, he goes beyond his boundaries and uh, he makes the law, will that law be implemented? No, as I said, what will happen is, uh, somebody was asking this question, what will happen? I think uh, Rishabh was asking the question. So what will happen? No, what will, be ha what will happen in this particular situation is that it creates, what it does is it slows down the judicial system because it creates more confusion in this particular case what will happen is because the lower courts are bound by the madras high court decision the district courts will now be confused should i follow this judge's decision because it's conflicting with the hindu marriage act which has been passed by parliament 
right so they will have to send it back to the high court to resolve the conflict so it slows down the decision making in this particular case eventually a decision like this would get shot down in india okay because uh, we don't allow this kind of uh, more or less the philosophy is there but it will slow down the because the high court judge still has that power nobody's going to punish him understand that what he has done he's not doing anything illegal because there's no law that forces him to follow formalism so that's why many judges this is just one example many judges create these kind of problems they uh, they throw spanners it's like a spanner in the works you know the expression spanner in the works means i jam up the whole process i throw a spanner in the machinery and uh, it jams up the whole process right so this is what many judges do right yeah one minute before that i'll come to krish uh, so yes sir uh, you said uh, road safety bill was implemented and many states denied that they were not then there is a problem between legislature yeah see in that case i don't know whether i think the definitely the we have to look at the competence aspect you know in india we have the competence aspect but assuming that the state the central uh, government was competent to uh, enact laws on that matter okay so in that case if there is this whole business is similar to the caa problem many states are saying we will not implement the law actually under the system in india you can't do that caa caa has been uh, uh, challenge not been challenged so in fact they can't do that if because central law will be uh, central law will supersede state law that's how india works okay most countries work on that basis even in the us which is a very decentralized system states have a lot of power but there's any conflict between the central law and the state law the central law will prevail even in the us so all other countries which are much more centralized like canada india in all these countries any conflict central law will prevail so that's a general principle okay so um yeah so uh, uh, where was i okay anybody else has so uh, you also had a question yeah no generally that is the type of violation of the structure that is what you see in legal realism that is the kind of violation that you see where the judge brings his personal remember one more thing that when the judiciary is interpreting the law i'll give you some examples later on we'll see that if a judge is following formalism okay what monira is asking is it's a good question that whether when we are talking about legal realism we gave one example where in a judge following legal realism which is the opposite of formalism uh, went on to remake the law so she's asking that this was a violation of this structure okay and in realism is that the only type of violation this hap that happens or other types of violations happen also so the answer is that that is pretty much the only type that happens that most of the cases of realism what happens is judges who believe in that philosophy they will essentially use their power to remake the law and to ignore the actual law that is on the books okay so we'll see more examples of that okay uh, so this is the idea all right so uh, any other questions at this point okay so let's go on further to understand you will understand it better when we see some examples yes bhavya you have a question okay so uh, all right so this is one of the points to understand when you're talking about formalism formalism is a broad view uh, based on structure and process that you respect the separation of powers idea okay the role of the judiciary under this particular scheme is only to interpret the law not to make the law if any law needs to be made it should be done by the legislature the judiciary can feel that there is a part where the judici the law is not clear the role of the judiciary is to send it back to the legislature say that please make some amendments and clarify this point because they should not be making the law this is the formal view of the this is the formal view that you see in legal formalism okay so this and then uh, therefore obviously to to uh, and there are certain sub uh, sub aspects of formalism let me just go down further and just talk about it these are very important both the doors are open in your class we should actually maybe not have both the doors open can you shut it fully just slam it shut so that we don't get any noise from other classes okay so you have some idea about formalism now okay let me give you another idea of formalism before we go into and i'll give you another idea of realism also but before that let me just go down the case a little bit and talk about one very good example of formalism i hope i didn't um Oh, I should not have closed it. I don't know. Sometimes I should not have closed it. Okay. Um, 
because many things are uh, blocked okay all right guys now what is happening here this is another thing that is happening people keep leaving from the class okay this is another thing which I'll have to crack down on eventually because in your seniors in the case of your seniors I had to do this that um, uh, if you leave the class you have a break in between because it's very distracting for the teacher what happens is one person is leaving as soon as she returns another person is leaving so it's like a constant parade going on in the class so it's very distracting for the teacher so I'll have to crack down on it from now on that you have a 15 minute break and I don't take much extra time maybe 40 seconds okay so uh, you are required to take care of your water bottle filling all the, everything you want to do take your use your 15 minute break because if you leave in the class I will deduct marks okay unless it's a medical emergency if I see somebody looking generally sick I never stop people so uh, in that case is different but otherwise you can't just go out okay all right so let's understand once again with a very good example let's understand formalism you guys remember that in 2015 there was this controversy where these uh, nearby con convict the juvenile convict was being released from prison and everybody was very angry that he should not be released but the Supreme Court allowed him to be released okay so this is that decision so the Supreme Court refuses to block release of the juvenile now look at what the court is saying I think here you will understand very well what is meant by um, legal formalism now here's a very good example of legal formalism read this is it clear to you if you can read can you read Janmeet yes. okay read this and see for yourself I will also add one more thing. That will make it very clear. Legal positivism, the law, as Jakar correct, very correctly pointed out, very good point actually, that you can't have formalism without positivism. Uh, so first you have to acknowledge that the merit of a law, the validity of a law determines, derives from the uh, process by which the law has been made were certain socio-political facts and not on the moral content of the law and then uh, you have a formalistic view of uh, interpreting the law so can you see what's going on here guys certain very key words so this is what the Supreme Court said in refusing to block the release of the juvenile convict right so they said what is this formalism or realism court has to go by the law as it stands today all right so it includes the idea of positivism what is the law what is written here not what I consider moral or immoral because here if you went by your morals okay what is the court saying we also share your concerns which means maybe the court these two judges Goel and Lalit maybe these two judges they also were morally outraged by the fact that the juvenile was going to be released maybe they also believed that it was immoral to release the juvenile but they have not allowed their own views of the morality or legal morality or ethic ethical nature of some action to influence their interpretation of the law because they are respecting the separation of powers their job is to interpret the law which is a strict belief in the what the law actually says right the court has to go by the law as it stands today even though we may be also morally not comfortable with releasing him but we are releasing him and what is he saying further if you want the court to further det uh, further detention uh, detain him further clear legislative sanction who will give the legislative sanction legislature among the three branches the three organs of state okay who will give the leg uh, legislative sanction the legislature will do it which means does it show respect for separation of powers yes. can see that okay please inform her in the future if you go out you'll lose marks from the next class onwards okay you need to take care of uh, everything in the breaks that's why the breaks are given so uh, okay guys now very important to understand this philosophy because this distinction is very important because it actually affects 
it actually affects the way that decisions are handed down by judges okay in the courts on a daily basis but in india we don't have an active debate about the uh, difference between formalism and realism and which is better and which philosophy should we follow we don't have the active debate but in fact what happens is some judges follow formalism and some judges follow realism so as a result of it you can get all kinds of funny decisions depending on who the judge is right so clearly you can see legal formalism from this decision we have to go by the law as it stands today we may also have comfort discomfort morally with the law but we will not allow that our moral views to come into the interpretation of the law and the decision in the case is this clear and if the law has to be changed who has to change it the legislature has to change it we are not going to remake the law if you want the any remaking of the law it has to be done by the legislature is this clear showing respect for the separation of powers doctrine very important to understand this philosophy so i'm spending a little bit of time on this okay now now you understand from some real examples what this is okay so now you understand very well what so formalism is i'll just give you one more uh, and realism is basically the opposite of formalism where in this case if it was realism these same judges if they believed in legal realism what they would have done is they would have blocked the release of the juvenile then said that even though the law says this but it is not good for society and all kinds of blah 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 all kinds of stuff they would come up with and they would find some reasons to say that uh, i mean this law is actually going back to natural law legal theory saying this law is not valid because it is immoral because it is leading to the release of the juvenile so we should block his release this is clear if they followed realism yes nobody is getting confused i hope right i'm saying if they followed realism that's what they would have done in this case they have followed formalism so they have not blocked the release they have allowed him to be released is this clear to everyone yes saloni are you following okay all right okay so um now i'll give you one more example of uh, realism okay so you can read about all these things later on instrumentalism is the same as realism it comes from the same philosophy i'll just give you briefly what realism is so realism basically says that it's perfectly fine for uh, decisions to be made based on the moral views of the judges that's what the system is supposed to do you don't have to follow the actual text of the law the moral views of the judges coming into the decision making that is perfectly fine okay so that's the philosophy legal realism okay so that's why i said that oh, as far as the choice of formalism or realism that choice is actually a normative choice you can't really prove that one is wrong or the other but uh, once you get into formalism that becomes a very strict uh, positive formalist kind of interpretation okay so uh, what was i talking about i'll give you one more example before i go okay now many of you might have heard about the shabano case it's a very uh, important case in indian judicial history from 1985 okay so i'll just briefly tell you i mean this is all in italics because it's it's optional i don't want to spend time on it if you want to read i, I didn't delete it because those who want to read further can read it okay i'll just briefly discuss all we are want to care about about the shabano case is that all we are interested in is that this is a case this is an instance of legal realism this is a case this is an instance where judges followed realism what did they do they so here you had this woman uh, so she was the, she was a muslim woman she was divorced by her husband okay and uh, she didn't have any money she was quite old also i think 68 or something and she was quite old so basically she was out on the street she didn't have any money and so she filed there's a provision in our uh, uh, crpc the code of criminal procedure 125 which deals with maintenance okay so basically any man who has sufficient means has to maintain his father mother wife children everybody okay and wife includes somebody who has been divorced but not has not remarried okay so she uh, so shabano applied under this provision and because she had not been remarried okay so there sure she applied for maintenance and she got maintenance from the lower courts and it was all approved by the higher courts also now eventually what happened even when it came to the supreme court the, the husband had uh, argued against that okay so and when it came to the supreme court the supreme court also ruled in her favor and gave her maintenance but actually this is an example of realism why because act, under the law if you look at look at the law strictly she is not entitled she was not entitled to get any more maintenance from her husband okay so let's see why 
so in the co in the crpc this is called crpc code of criminal procedure okay that is criminal procedure code so cr pc okay so here there's another section 127 so 125 gives you the right to claim the allowance 127 actually says that there are certain cases when the allowance will be cancelled the court will cancel the order for allowance okay what are some of those cases one of those let's look at 127 3b now the woman has been divorced by her husband and she has received the whole of the sum etc etc which under any personal law was payable on such divorce okay so this is clearly referring remember these things are written by the brits these laws were all written by the british the philosophy of the british was that we will take out all the economic wealth from this country but we will not interfere with the locals and let the hindus manage their own affairs let the muslims manage their own affairs we are not going to interfere with their personal laws okay so one of the things that they did here in because of that now this provision if you see was clearly meant to include because under muslim personal law there's a provision that there's a concept of dower meher or dower which you have to pay before the either you pay at the time of the marriage or before the marriage or if it has not been paid then you must pay after divorce okay within a period after divorce okay so in this case she had been paid that money after she was divorced okay in this case shabano was paid this money and if you look at the law as such strictly as written this provision was meant to exclude muslim uh, the muslim community from the uh, provisions of 125 this was written by the british okay so they said that we don't want to interfere with the personal law so where the personal law is providing for some payment to be made on divorce okay which is the money that if you have not paid it at the time of marriage you must pay at the time of divorce okay and this woman had received this money okay she had received this money so strictly speaking under the law with the, and this is what her husband argued that she's not entitled to anything more because of this provision okay but the supreme court what did they do they realized that it's strictly speaking if you go by the law she will not get anything but then what will happen this poor woman she is going to be out on the streets she is old woman and she can't earn anything so she's an old woman and now what will happen so what the supreme court did was they gave her some additional maintenance so they ignored the actual text of the law because under the actual text of the law she would not have got anything more and they gave her some additional amounts okay and how did they do that they said basically they used what is called a purposive approach so they said that what is the purpose of uh, what have i done here i can't even see what i'm clicking okay or what i'm typing here okay so uh, they what did they say they said that the pur the purpose of 125 crpc is uh, to prevent vagrancy you know what vagrancy is vagrancy is homelessness essentially like a person is out on the streets and just walking around no place to go okay so they said that the purpose of 125 crpc is to prevent vagrancy okay so what we are going to do is and if we read the law very strictly then what will happen is this woman will not get any more money and she will be out on the streets so that will defeat the purpose of the law are you following the logic okay uh, so that's why this is called a purposive approach where you try to look at what is the purpose of this law when there's some apparent conflict you think there's a conflict between the purpose of the law and the strict letter of the law okay there is some confu confusion that is coming up so what they said was basically that if you look at the purpose of crpc if we follow this exception and don't allow her any more money she will be out on the streets it will defeat the purpose of the law so we cannot allow that to happen so therefore we are going to ignore this part and we are going to give her some more maintenance okay so that's what the court did essentially so here i'm citing this as an example of re uh, realism okay you understand what is going on here the court is reading the law strictly if you the court sees that if you read the law strictly she will not get any more money and so what will happen you will have a result you will have a result which the court considers to be immoral that woman will be out on the streets old woman will be out on the streets that court considers this to be an immoral or an undesirable result are you following the logic okay so the court does not think this is a fair or just result so justice is also often used that this is not a fair or just result that an old woman should be out on the street so the court ignores the strict letter of the law and uses ideas like the purpose of the purposive approach to interpreting laws what is the purpose of the law and finds a way to do what the court thinks is correct are you following the logic 
the court thinks this is the same as uh, this is why it's realism in realism what does the judge do the judge decides what is the correct outcome in the case the judge decides what is the correct beforehand he decides when he looks at the case and decides what is the fair and just outcome in the case and they give the judgment in such a way that the outcome is what they want what they think is the fair and just outcome not necessarily what is written in the law is this clear yeah 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 yes so that's why we are discussing formalism versus realism as one of these distinctions so as monira has already anticipated our next discussion next part of the discussion is now we go back to normative versus positive and we compare formalism and realism and we try to compare and match it with normative versus positive so as she has correctly pointed out so realism is a is more like normative or positive normative, normative right because you decide what should happen in a particular case and then if the law is not supporting that view then you ignore the law and still give the judgment in such a way that you get the result that you think is fair and you think is just is this clear everyone understands okay so we are not trying to understand that you don't have to agree with one position or the other we are trying to understand the philosophy now this is very important to understand because as part of your judicial training that uh, because it in this is actually going on in india you will see this going on in india some judges follow realism some judges follow formalism but we don't have an active debate in this country about these philosophies okay which should we follow like uh, we have debates about reservation and this and that but we don't have a debate about this so but it actually affects judicial decision making on a daily basis so i feel we should have a debate on this and so i'll just briefly uh, cover a couple of other points here you can read all this stuff i'm not going to go through every line okay in formalism there's another there's a couple of other terms you need to know okay one is textualism textualism is basically nothing but the same idea follow the black letter law black letter law why because laws are always written like this there's a white background and this is black lettering so what they're saying black letter law is an expression we use which is to say just right follow the law as it is written don't bring your personal views about morality and all that and justice and fairness into it just read the law and interpret the law as it is so textualism essentially is about following the text following the black letter law and then there's a subclass of textualism which is originalism these are terms you need to be aware of which is a theory of constitutional interpretation which is again you can see everything is logical okay so originalism is a philosophy is is formalism applied to constitutional interpretation okay which is that when we interpret the constitution we will interpret it based on whatever was the original public meaning of those words in the constitution is this clear okay why original public meaning because remember who has to make the law legislature. legislature has to make the law so if you are if i am a judge my job is not to make the law so i will read the law in the exact same way that people understood the law when it was written are you following the logic it's all consistent that originalism means you interpret like in the us the constitution is nearly 250 years old but they will when they are interpreting something if it is actually 250 years old it was written 250 years ago they will think about what was the meaning of that word 250 years ago and they will interpret it that way interpret it in that way is this clear you get the logic why because any other interpretation means that you are making the law because if there was some changes required that was written in that statement was written in that word in the constitution was written in 1790 let's say and if you want me to change it that means you are asking me to rewrite the law if some change was required it would have been done by the legislature because you have constitutional amendments you understand what i'm saying you can see how originalism is completely consistent with formalism all these elements are very consistent with each other that ultimately it boils down to that respect for the for separation of powers doctrine and the role of the judges is not to make the law so wherever a law needs to be made they will push it back to the legislature and say that if any amendment is required i will go by the original public meaning of 1790 if you want me to change it go and ask the legislator to amend the constitution are you following the logic yes. okay so it's all the same it's all consistent here okay now just briefly here 
a couple of other points I just want to explain the sentence to make sure that you're aware of how to write these things uh, I mean how, how, how not to how to write it in an exam or something here how to understand the statement we also discussed descriptive versus prescriptive remember okay so we had a long discussion about formalism and realism okay you can read about formalism and realism here okay and instrumentalism is the same as realism very similar okay now what are they saying here that formalism and realism can be understood either in a descriptive or in a prescriptive way all right what does that mean that i could like this discussion i've had with you so far what am i trying to do i'm trying to explain what formalism is explain what realism is have i said anything about which i wh what i think which one i think is a better method no so i'm only you so this discussion so far about these two topics has been held in a has been conducted in a descriptive way because i've tried to describe to you what these things are okay but now if i go and tell you that um where is this uh, yeah now if i give you my personal view which i should also do because i you just have to make not because I, you should agree with my view but you should know what a view is what a view looks like and how it is justified you should learn that you can adopt any view but you should know how what a view looks like and how it is justified so i prefer formalism because in formalism you have a greater certain greater probability of uh, certainty and consistent results okay why is that think about it if every judge is forced to follow the text of the law when any decision on public offers you have to follow this section and other sections so if every judge is being forced to follow the strict text of the law do you think it's more likely to read to lead to consistent decisions because how much can you differ when it when it comes to interpreting words right unlike unlike realism where you say that in the shabano case they completely ignored section 127 3b so there you have more room for subjectivity because you're allowing under realism you're allowing judges to say that okay the written text is not so important what is important is what do you think is the moral course of action what do you think is the fair course of action are you following the logic right so under realism you have greater risk of because and moral what is morals morals are subjective or objective subjective, subjective. so my morals will be different from say chinmay's morals from krishna's morals everything is different everybody's morals are different right so now if three of us are judges i'll give one kind of decision he will give one kind of decision krish will give some other kind of decision so what will happen is that there is a greater risk of uh, all kinds of uh, incoherent and inconsistent decisions are you following the logic yeah so those who prefer legal formalism like me we one of the reasons we prefer it is because forcing people to stick to the text is a gives you a higher probability of giving consistent results and that is one of the important function of the role the res, results should be consistent okay second is that it also it's a formalist view that it forces the judges to remain in the role of only interpreting the law and not making the law is this clear okay so these are some of the reasons why people who prefer formalism do so uh, these are the justifications that they give all right so these are some of these points and i think we have covered everything here one minute yeah here there are some so in general everything is uh, i didn't put this in italics but i'm just telling you that this is an ital this is optional okay you want to study this mooc you can study this mooc this is i don't think it's very good but it's on the topic so i've given it to you here okay everything is okay now i'm just going to point out a few other things okay this entire discussion that we are having instrumentalism very similar to fair realism okay i have given you all these discussions okay on the shabano case guys quiet quiet while the class is going on i don't want to hear any of this murmuring okay it should be very quiet uh, if you want to read all this is optional all in italics but if you want to read more uh, after the shabano case there's an act which the parliament passed then there are some other famous cases daniel latifi these kind of things if you want to read you can read it okay uh now as far as the syllabus is concerned we are stopping this discussion now as far as normative versus positive and the similar concepts concepts related to normative versus positive but 
if you are interested in learning more i have given you some more more material ex ante versus ex post these are some other distinctions consequentialist versus deontological consequentialism versus deontological perspectives okay uh, so this these two are kind of optional for you this is not part of your syllabus okay so if you want read if you want to read more you can read it but i would like to check one thing ex ante versus ex post ex ante is before or after ex ante is before okay yes so ex ante is before and ex post is after okay so the you should be aware of these terms at least okay uh, when you because they can come up in other contexts as well all right so don't start packing up we still have some time people are like just because i i felt like one minute one minute one minute, one minute. <laughs> One minute. One minute. No, no. One minute. One sec. One sec. I have to maintain parity between the sections. So I have to. I don't want to see all this crybaby stuff. Okay. I will release you. I will release you now. You are not babies anymore. You are behaving like class two uh, children. You know. Um, so. Okay. Now we are going into one minute. We have some time. I'll just briefly cover one. One minute. One minute. One minute, one sec, one sec. So we are starting. We are starting the uh, the part B. Now India is a common law system. Okay, common law systems you find in the UK, US. Be quiet. Be quiet now, Brathika. Be quiet now. Just behave yourself for two more minutes. Okay. Uh, in India, we you need to know these terms: civil law versus common law. Civil law is what you get in continental Europe. Okay, France, Germany, Italy. Okay, and uh, common law is all the British colonies. Okay, and the main difference between common law systems and civil law systems is <coughs> what we call judicial precedent. That is previous decisions handed down by courts. So in civil law systems, which we are not going to study in detail, uh, judicial precedent is not that important. But in common law system, is very important. You'll see this when we do our cases. Uh, the precedents that are used to decide cases; these are very important. And the other point here is that we have uh, actually most of our systems now in India, U.S., Australia, Canada. These are mixed systems because we not only do we follow judicial precedents, that is previous decisions, we also follow codified law. Okay, what is codified law? Codified law is something. Like this, okay. Codified law here. This is Companies Act, okay. This Section 23 of the Companies Act. This is what is meant by codified law. Any act, contract acts, transfer of property act. These are codified laws, and judicial precedents are the previous decisions of the courts, okay. And so we follow. We follow both. So we are not just a common law system. Actually, a mixed system, but we still call them common law systems, okay. All these are called. So there's a presentation here on another point. You need to understand. Prospectively is forward looking. Prospectively is forward looking. Retrospectively is backward looking. Okay. So after the famous Vodafone judgment, we had, we had, okay. So I'll stop it here. After the former Vodafone judgment, we had some retrospective amendments to the Income Tax Act. Those applied from like before, not just from 2012, but from 1980 onwards. Let's say. All right. Okay. You can read this presentation. I'm not going to cover it in detail, and we'll go on with the rest. Okay. These are all optional. So I took how many? How many seconds? Forty seconds. Not even forty seconds. Today, okay. So retrospectively means that. Um, where is this? Like, where is it? Something seemed to have happened. The the law. Anyway, retrospectively means. Uh, okay, here. Retrospectively means that with uh, effect from before the current period. So, if they made some changes in 2012 to the Income Tax Act, those changes would be made applicable from before. So, for instance, you're making the change in 2012, but you say that this change will apply from 1980. 
You say that a change will apply from 1980. You are making the change only in 2012. Okay, but you make you say that the change is going to apply from 1980, which means this change is being uh, this change is uh, is happening with retrospective effect. Sir, if someone from those times going to file a case, then uh, no longer be applied Yeah. So any if it is retrospective effect means any case, let's say from 2012, you say something applies with retrospective effect from 1980. Now any case which was started in let's say 1995, that will now uh, that case will have to be decided including the new changes from 2012 which are retrospectively applied so it's actually being going so that is the meaning of retrospective going back retrospective is usually applied with the word effect that this law this change will have retrospective effect which means it will be applied from before usually most laws have only a prospective effect that means you make it in 2012 now it applies from 2012 onwards. No, no, no. It depends on how they make the law. Generally, we follow prospective. Generally, all laws are have prospective effect, but sometimes they may make laws which will have retrospective effect. But it's quite rare. I don't know. Yeah. So when you give the example of adultery, uh, Supreme Court has given given the verdict that adultery is uh, not uh, illegal in India. Yeah. So, will uh, Supreme Court has just said that. Yeah. It's not a law, right? No, no, no. <laughs> there is a provision, we'll see, that there is a provision here that the law given by the Supreme Court, um, yeah, Article 141, okay, which basically says that um, the law given by the Supreme Court is the law of the land. So, whatever they say is the law of the land. So, now you can't, let's say, you so, but judiciary does not have the uh, power to make yeah. laws. So, so you can say this is an example of realism. You can say this is an example of realism. But at the same time, we seem to have allowed for it because in our constitution it says that, um, you see Article 141, the constitution says that the law given by the Supreme Court is the law of the land. So, so we that have that essentially, that that yeah, it says law declared by the Supreme Court is binding on all the courts within the territory of India. So that will force everybody to apply according to that. So does that mean that uh, judiciary and legislators give the sharing the power? Like they are? They are sharing the power. No, Supreme in Court this case, it's just, power. It, this is clearly a case of realism where the Supreme Court has decided that this particular provision uh, is no longer to be, uh, is, con is unconstitutional. Okay? And they have unconstitutional grounds, they have struck down the provision. So this power is given to the Supreme Court under the Constitution. They can interpret the laws or provisions of laws under their to by judging their constitutionality. Uh, and that is the example of realism. Yeah, that is an example. Realism is broader than that. Realism is much broader than that because constitutional act, constitutional uh, I mean assessing the constitutionality of a law is a very narrow scope because you're only because it's only when you challenge the law on constitutional grounds. But if it's not on a if the challenge is not on a constitutional ground, okay, even then you can have realism. Okay? Yeah. And, and here the Supreme Court has actually been given power, but even our 141 actually doesn't say that this is only true for constitutional challenges. So in India we have effectively uh, endorsed realism in the constitution by giving the Supreme Court this power to say what the law is. This realism concept is uh, the of judiciary part. Sorry? This is the concept of realism uh, is only for the judiciary part. Like the yeah, yeah. Judicial real, realism and formalism are methods of interpretation. Interpretation of judicial, judicial philosophies. Okay. Judicial philosophies. So some judges follow formalism, some judges follow realism. Yeah. But in in India, we have essentially allowed realism under the constitution because we said whatever the Supreme Court says is the law of the land. Yes. Okay. So we have allowed, in a way, we have endorsed realism, okay. and this can extend to any kind of question, not just a question of a on something on constitutional grounds. So, uh, the example you gave of the Karnataka is that Madras, that case, Madras High Court, yeah. Madras High Court, yeah. The, that case goes up to Supreme Court. 
and Supreme Court, for example, says that yes, uh, this is a law. Uh, if two, uh, it is the law. It is, it is the law. It is the law. They have overruled uh, the uh, the legislature. So that is the law because we have allowed them under Article yeah, yeah. 141. We have allowed them. We have not said the Article 141 only for constitutional issues. No. No. So although there are some limitations on what kind of cases the Supreme yeah, Court yeah, can yeah. try, but effectively those limitations don't exist because you can apply under uh, special leave petition and all that. So effectively the Supreme Court has tremendous power in India. Tremendous power. Okay.